too bad Malcolm couldn't be here in person because he is um, notoriously a big hugger and quite often I have to stand on a chair to get a hug from Malcolm. But uh, someday I hope you all get to meet him in pers person because he's a wonderful man. So he served uh, 30 odd years in the Canadian Forces, um, progressive leadership, strategic planning and organizational change experiences. Malcolm's wide range of skills have been sought out to support the strategic planning and execution of operations, including in 2002, the Kananaskis G8 Summit, in 2010, the Vancouver Winter Olympics, and then the devastating 2013 Alberta floods. He has been deployed overseas five times, including Iraq in 2006, where he served as the strategic force planner while on exchange with the British Army and to Af Afghanistan for 12 month deployment as the chief of advisors for the Afghan ministerial development mission. And he's also a humble recipient of the Meritorious Service Medal. Retiring in 2012, he served as the director of corporate services for the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists. But this is when uh, he came into my life. So in 2015, he took on the daunting role of CEO of the Capital Region Board. Uh, trying to corral 24 mayors in the region. And in my opinion, his shining achievement was the development of our regional growth plan. Uh, then in uh, 2018, I believe it was, he uh, get, took on another huge role, which I won't go too, too much into today because I'm sure this is what he's going to be speaking about. But he is now the CEO of uh, Edmonton Global, which is a regional uh, economic development entity with which is tasked with investment and trade in our region. On a bit of a personal level, he's still involved with the military. He's a trustee with the foundation of the Princess Patricia Canadian Light Infantry and remains an active volunteer supporting military families. He and his wife, Shauna, happily married for, I read, 24 years, um, have three daughters, and you will see them at almost any fundraiser that is uh, being run by the Princess Patricia, whether it's a breakfast or the French uh, Grey Ball. I love seeing Malcolm and I welcome him wholeheartedly this morning. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. <laughs> miss him. I miss you, Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna try and share my screen with everybody uh, and then uh, hopefully that will work. And I just asked, can everybody see that on their screens? And can everybody hear me okay? All right, perfect, thank you. So I'll probably speak for about 20, 25 minutes and then uh, lots of time for questions and answers there afterwards. Um, so really, I really wanna thank this, uh, the Rotary Club uh, representing the fine city of St. Albert to be able to speak about the Edmonton metropolitan region. As Kathy mentioned, it's pretty near and dear to my heart and I've been pretty involved with it for the last five or so years. I will do this presentation in two parts. The first will be speaking about Edmonton Global, charged by the shareholders of which St. Albert is one, to drive more investment and trade opportunities into the region. And second, speak about COVID and its economic impacts. Edmonton Global has 15 shareholder member municipalities, illustrated on the map. They've hired a professional board of a broad array of business leaders from within the region and a professional management team. Importantly, they were created a company to work at the speed of business. So with that in mind, we wanted to make sure we were starting from a, a position of understanding and knowledge. So some may ask why Edmonton Global? Simply put, we were spending far too much time competing amongst ourselves within the region and not focused on where our true competitors lay which are globally. So we began there. We hired the Conference Board of Canada to do a benchmarking study against 21 other global regions of similar makeup or ones that we aspire to emulate in terms of their success. We finished in the middle of the past. In the three buckets we examined, we finished well in the social, you could expect that being Canadian, so quality of life, livability, and those kind of uh, qualities. Middle of the pack for competitiveness, and near the bottom for economic development factors. Noteworthy is many of these factors are not necessarily just a regional problem. For example, productivity is an example where 
it's a national issue. What this study highlighted was that we needed to work collaboratively with our federal, provincial, and regional partners if we were truly going to become more globally competitive. The next thing we did was we went out to 22 different international site selectors, a proxy for the larger international investment community. And as you can see from the results, when asked if they thought about our region as a recommended place to investors to invest, either to expand or open new facilities, you will note that 82% of them don't think about us at all. The other 18%, when they did think of us, it was around energy, but when asked to describe what they thought about this region, we were called cold, remote, and disconnected. This then gave us a very useful starting point to start to change the dial and create a new compelling regional narrative uh, about who we are and what we represent. So let's talk a little bit about what that narrative started to include. The first one was about innovation. Most Canadians, never mind anybody else globally, knew that the University of Alberta was ranked at one point two years ago, number two in the world for artificial intelligence and still ranked number three or number four globally for that capacity. Innovation is a key component of our narrative. Prior to COVID-19, Alberta was Canada's most competitive province. Now, some of these considerations are changing, as we all know, but there are two that I would like to highlight that I do believe will endure post-COVID-19. One is that it's one of the best places to live according to international rankings, and two, it's one of the fastest growing jurisdictions in North America. This then started to frame out a theme that we wanted to build uh, our regional narrative around, that we were young, that we were educated, and that we were growing. Our region is the second youngest in Canada, just behind Saskatoon, if anybody's asking wants to know. Saskatoon just uh, became the youngest last year. We have the best K-12 education system in Canada, supported by seven incredible post-secondary institutions with over 130,000 students currently going through various programs in those seven institutions. Those seven institutions also graduate between 22 and 30,000 new students every single year. And the last component on growing is even in our economically stressed economy from 2014 to now, we were seeing net migration into the region coupled with natural growth because of our youthfulness. These were significant competitive advantages when starting to compare ourselves in a global context. The next point was about connectivity or connectedness. One of the things that, uh, as indicated, that people thought we were disconnected, the opposite is exactly uh, the way it is. Uh, given our northern location, our circumpolar connectivity on air routes to Asia are the best there uh, in any G7 country. Our airport runs 24 hours a day, only one of three airports in Canada that has 24 hour operations. Our road connectivity, both east-west and north-south, is uh, exceptional. And our CN and CP rail networks connect here in this region, uh, including uh, around what we've called an inland port or Port Alberta. Canada also is the only G7 country that has free trade agreements with every other G7 nation, and it gives us access to 1.5 billion potential customers. But like all of us, if we don't focus, we won't really be very good at anything that we've done. We undertook a pretty comprehensive assessment on where we thought we had some strengths and where the opportunities lie. And we settled on these four key vertical sectors, energy, including clean tech, manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, agriculture and food, health and life science. These were all underpinned by a horizontal of advanced technology uh, and, and artificial intelligence, because most techies will tell you they're not a sector. Uh, they enable and enhance all these other traditional sectors in and on themselves, as well as an integrated uh, supply chain of logistics and transportation. This is where our value proposition lies for our region. So that's kind of setting the conditions. Now let's talk a little bit about COVID-19. Some of what I'm about to say is pretty stark, and, and I think people need to recognize that there are conditions that we are currently living under that will have 
uh, impact that will be enduring as we go forward. These economic impacts from COVID and the oil crisis, both home and globally, uh, will see some mitigation in the short term. I'll point out some of the trends and opportunities we're seeing coming out of the immediate crisis as we transition to the recovery phase. Spending by consumers drives so much of our economic activity, and as a result of containment measures taken to prevent further spread of COVID-19 virus, consumer demand as well as supply has been mostly halted across the board, and economic activity is nearly frozen globally. The double threat to consumer supply and demand has led to this outpacing previous global stock market shocks, such as the Great Depression and the 2008 global financial crisis. All companies and sectors in the stock market are being hit by the current economic crisis, but not all are being hit to the same degree and in the same way. The reality is investors are parking their money on the sideline waiting for the storm to, to pass. One of the trends we are closely monitoring is the increased tendency towards protectionism. This shows a trend towards reshoring certain uh, aspects of supply chains and restrictions on imports. In addition, we are seeing a tightening of FDI policies in many countries. Mostly, this is a thinly veiled protection measure against Chinese, particularly state-owned companies. As China emerges from the pandemic early than, earlier than the rest of the world, they are in search of critical supplies and bolstering damaged sectors and supply chains. Other, companies feeling particularly other countries feeling particularly vulnerable while still in the midst of managing the pandemic have tightened up their screening and policies for foreign investment. The Canadian government was even more explicit, publishing a policy statement that announced enhanced scrutiny of foreign direct investment of any value, controlling or non-controlling, in Canadian businesses that are related to public health or involved in the supply of critical goods and services to Canadians or to the government. The increase in globalization has shifted the structure of the economy over time to a point where long distance travel, face-to-face -face interactions, cross-border commuting, and, ge and geographic expansive uh, supply chains are commonplace, increasing the interdependency between companies for important goods and services. Pharmaceuticals are a poignant example of the geographic expanse of supply chains. Drugs are manufactured from component parts made from all over the world, much like cars. Very few of these drugs sold and used in Canada are made in Canada. Canada is, is not only the world's 13th largest importer of pharmaceutical products, but most of Canada's pharmaceutical imports, 31%, come from the United States. These drugs are assembled in the U.S., however, raw materials come in large portion from China. India is one of the world's largest pharmaceutical manufacturers, and India pharma companies get almost 70% of their active pharmaceutical ingredients for their medicines from China. This interdependency means that any disruption in one company or country's supply chain affects the entire world's supply of pharmaceutical products. Canada's trade flows are expected to be severely disrupted for the good part of 2020. Disruptions to global oil supply chains, declining business confidence and investment, and a major contraction in the U.S. economy, economic growth will impact trade flows and the growth prospects for Canada's export sector this year. By assuming the virus is successfully contained by the, uh, but assuming that the virus is successfully contained by the end of Q4 2020, a resurgence of trade activity is expected into 2021 as the pandemic and its effects start to subside. So let's now start looking at a little bit of what's happening in terms of reopening across the globe. The pandemic began in China in December of last year and through lockdown measures were implemented in January. For the first few months of the year, China's case and death count rose rapidly and continuously. China started lifting its lockdown measures in late March, but a month and a half later is reinstating some of these lockdowns following new clusters of cases being reported in various regions, including those where the outbreak first began in the Wuhan province. South Korea was also among the first to experience the pandemic. In February, the South Korean had the largest outbreak outside of China, but used a combination of testing, tracing, 
public health measures and technology to contain the virus without having to impose widespread lockdowns. Restrictions and lockdowns across Europe began to lift in mid-April and opening of schools and other businesses began in early to mid-May with the exception of Italy, which alongside China is one of the worst and first, first and worst countries globally to experience a COVID outbreak. But only a month after opening, reopening, some parts of Europe have seen a new spike in COVID cases. Germany, for example, has considered what, had been considered one of the countries who are most effectively managed the outbreak. But since loosening its lockdown and containment measures, seemingly bowing to public pressure and protests, their reproduction numbers have risen above the threshold. And the threshold means one person is infecting more than one other person. Meanwhile, in the efforts to salvage tourism industries, the European Commission has recommended that EU countries with similar rates of infection and comparatively strong healthcare system begin lifting border measures between each other. Possibly the biggest impact and risk to Canada is what's happening to our neighbors to the south. At the outset of the outbreak, the US deemed to be the country that had, would have the, the capacity to be most prepared for the pandemic. But months later, the US is widely being criticized for its failure to contain the virus, mostly due to the slow reaction time out of Washington. The United States is now the country with the highest number of cases in the world. Although I will admit there is some broad skepticism about the accuracy of China's numbers that are being reported. They have been widespread protests in the US as well to reopen the economy and many states have begun to ease instruction, restrictions and lockdowns. However, states along the West Coast and who border Ontario and Quebec are still under considerable restrictions or lockdown. Dr. Foshi, the top U.S. infection specialist, disease specialist, has warned that the country does not yet have the disease under control and that easing lockdowns too soon risk unnecessarily deaths. President Trump has called his warning unacceptable. So let's focus a little bit more on home. Uh, the numbers on the chart, please don't, they're, they're a couple of, uh, they're a week, week old, so please don't take them verbatim. As you know, every day they tend to change, so these are not necessarily accurate numbers, they're more representative. But comparatively, Canada and especially Alberta have done a commendable job in containing the spread of the virus, with a few pockets of exception. With per capita differences taken into account, the number of deaths in the U.S. from COVID was roughly four times that of Canada. Most of this is due to unprecedented speed of which containment measures were put in place in Canada. Alberta in particular has been lauded for our handling of the public health aspect of this crisis. As we know, last week, Alberta began the stage one of the relaunch program. Much of the rest of Canada is working on the same relaunch timelines and the plan as Alberta has is a staged approach in the stage one beginning in earlier mid-May. With the exceptions of Ontario and Quebec who have seen higher numbers of cases and deaths and are taking a more cautious approach to reopening, Montreal and Cal Calgary are also on a later reopening schedule uh, than the rest of their provinces because of their pockets that they've had severe outbreaks in. Switching gears to a bit of domestic economic policy, the depth and length of the recession depends on two factors public health measures and economic policy intervention. The policy intervention can be broken down into two parts or phases. The first is stabilization and the second is stimulus. Stabilization measures speak to the jurisdiction's ability to weather the economic storm, our resiliency. And you'll note from this slide, the federal government has initiated quite a number of economic stabilization members. This list is not exhaustive. The next phase, stimulus, is critically important to our economic recovery. We are still waiting for actions from both levels of government on stimulus. But just so you know, Edmonton Global has made a number of recommendations to both our federal and provincial partners. Premier Kennedy has indicated that COVID-19 economic recovery plan is forthcoming, and the federal minister of finance has announced that there'll be an economic update in June. However, there is no word yet from the federal government on a 2020 budget or the stimulus plan. So let's look at economic forecasts. So there's a lot of text on this. The one key takeaway, please, that you should take off of this particular slide 
is of all the G7 countries in China, only China is forecasted by the end of 2021 to have a larger economy than they did in 2019. All G7 countries are expected to have a smaller economy than they did in 2020, by 2021 than they did in 2019. In terms of Alberta's economy, it's expected to contract by roughly 5% in 2020, but should rebound sharply in 2021, but still below 2019 levels. This will make Alberta, Ontario, and Saskatchewan as the three major economies that will have smaller, uh, smaller than 2019 economies by the end of 2021. Employment. These figures are from the 8th of May and account for job numbers covering the period of April 2019 to April 2020. Alberta has lost 380,000 jobs. Within the region itself, we've lost 72,500 jobs. So enough of the hard news. Let's move on to some of the things where the future may hold some light for us. Um, so there's three things that when uh, the recent site selector, again, the site selector guild is this representative folks that go out and help multinationals find new location or expansion locations. We, they were asked what sort of three key trends do they see on a, on a go forward basis? And really they boil it down into three things, technology, onshoring and movement. And I'll explain briefly what each one of those uh, sort of means and has some relevance to us. The first one is that the move to technology or digitization will accelerate. A great example, believe it or not, is our Alberta Health Services. Uh, many of you may uh, have seen that we were able to provide uh, medical supplies to both Ontario, Quebec, and British Columbia. And that was largely because we have an integrated supply chain where there was full visibility on the supply side of what we had in stock. Now, some may have issues with the distribution, uh, within the context, but the fact that the Alberta Health Services and an integrated supply chain had full visibility of their, of their products uh, was a key component. And on a go forward basis, you will not be part of a supply chain unless you are digitizing and uh, uh, using technology to integrate in a more comprehensive and transparent way. Onshore, and we spoke briefly about, about there will be a move to onshore certain supply chains. And this will be done not necessarily from a market driven perspective, but from a national security perspective. And then finally, the third trend, which I found most interesting, most relevant to us was shifting businesses to lower cost jurisdictions. So that means that places like the Edmonton metropolitan region that has an incredible livability and affordability will be places that will become more and more attractive to uh, those that are looking to do business. The other aspect is on airports, as you know, uh, currently, uh, we were used to a very efficient way of getting through airports for movement. That is becoming very different in the, in the go forward basis. So smaller airports such as the Edmonton International Airport will become a, a hopefully a, a, a move away from the hub and spoke kind of uh, airline approach to a, a more network based approach. The other thing is how we engage with each other, uh, within businesses, within communities will be changing. Uh, a recent announcement today or this week by Shopify to say they have moved to a work from home uh, prospect permanently. Um, so this will become some of the new norms for many companies, not necessarily all the way we meet, like we're doing this morning on, on Zoom and virtual meetings and tours. We need to think about how we change and restructure our businesses to be able to become attractive and maintain the customer base we're looking for, whether it's international investors in my case or individual clients in your case, is an important consideration. Uh, there will also be winners and losers. Zoom and Amazon are great examples of those that are winning. Amazon has hired another 175,000 people over during the course of the crisis uh, to be able to meet the demand. However, tourism and travel, as we know, are losers, and uh, these losses are going to continue in the foreseeable future. When Air Canada lays off 20,000 people, they are significantly looking at the future, and currently, as pre-COVID, Air Canada was moving about 1,500 flights a day. Their forecast for the foreseeable two to three years is 300 flights a day. 
So that is why they are playing hardball uh, and uh, knocking the amount of their employees down I say, to less than 50% of what the current workforce is today. So things are changing in these spaces. Activating our networks will be a key consideration for regional businesses uh, and other uh, networks that we have to be able to promote and create opportunity within this region. What we're really talking about is be all becoming ambassadors for why this is a great place to invest and a great place to live. How you can help. I am looking for you to become those regional ambassadors. Many of you already are. Many of you already have great networks and you talk about uh, why you are here, why your business is set up here, and why you've chosen to live here and raise your families here. We need you to promote those across your networks that are both international but also domestic across the country. Uh, on our website, which is built for uh, external investors and the like, we also have a download section. And uh, we in there is a much in information about our sectors, about the region itself, and I encourage folks to go to that so you too can have the materials at hand to become one of those regional ambassadors. And finally, I also run a couple of newsletters. One is a weekly one for the regional, uh, for domestic consumption, uh, which is a weekly one you can sign up for. And the other one is a global one, which goes out to currently about 900 international players uh, that I do every month. Uh, mostly trade commissioner services, Alberta trade offices and others. But if you're interested in finding out about uh, or, or joining those uh, newsletters, um, I would say they're quite informative. Uh, and I'm now happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, Malcolm, it's uh, Myron here. Great to connect again virtually. Um, yeah, I'm just curious what your thoughts are. You touched a little bit on the energy sector. Uh, I mean, Alberta has been impacted uh, significantly and, um, you know, we're trying to get some pipelines built to the south and across and it uh, seems like there's always political interference, disruptions. What's your thoughts on that and what do we do to help get through that energy sector process, including environmental issues? So, um... There were a couple of problems before COVID and those problems continue to exist. Investor confidence in one of them in Canada's ability to be able to drive major infrastructure projects, full stop. And part of the reason why was because we used to have a basis of a, um, um, a framework to get projects approved, which was regulatory based, right? It's facts based, it's data driven. It's a known process. People had confidence at the end of that process, they would get a yes, no decision. Then uh, about five years ago, we added this political layer onto every major infrastructure project. So that adds uncertainty. And then we've added a judicial process on top of that because the courts are now becoming very active in all of these things. So from an international investor perspective, they are looking at the, the, hot, the hurdles that they need to cross to be able to deliver on a major piece of infrastructure. And I will tell you that it's becoming uh, significantly challenging uh, to entice people to come here and do that. So what kind of things can we do to start to incentivize confidence in the international community? And, I, and I'm saying it's not just energy, it's across the board. Yeah. Um, so uh, working with our federal partners in particular because they hold the strings on some of those political regulatory and, and and judicial aspects is saying you need to understand that your decisions have resulted in this and i'll give you an example i was talking to the deputy head of mission from japan to canada and this was just before covid hit and his question to me was will lng, LNG canada go and LNG Canada's got indigenous approval, it's got political approval, it's got judicial approval, and it's got regulatory approval. And he's asking me if that $40 billion project's going to go. And this has got every tick in the box. So that tells you the kind of lack of confidence that international investors have in our country to deliver. So what we need to do is we need to continue to pound hard on all our federal representatives in particular that their actions domestically drive uh, outcomes globally. 
And that also includes, I'm going to be blunt with our own premier. Uh, you know, he's on the bandwagon quite a bit about energy and the negativity around the, the, the impacts of energy. If you look in our global marketplace, they, they, they pick up all that negativity, right? So it just exacerbates some of the investor confidence challenge we have. So I think we need to just say, yes, there are issues here, but this is a great place to invest. We've got fantastic talent. We have the best uh, ecological and environmental uh, you know, uh, regulations of any G7 country in the world. We're stable. We've got a whole number of attributes that we need to reinforce and start talking and getting off the negative, recognizing there's some of these challenges that are ongoing. I appreciate that. Thanks, Malcolm. Uh, so I've got a chat question here. One of them was, uh, at stage Edmonton was ranked number three in the world. Has that changed? Yes. So um, uh, energy is very much a focus of this province, but I think what, we're, what we also need to do is look at those emerging technologies and emerging opportunities in places like artificial intelligence. We have this basis of an incredible opportunity around it. So we were ranked number two at one point. Now we're ranked probably number four because other people are starting to bypass us because we're not taking full advantage of the opportunity we have. Uh, for example, uh, MIT has just announced a $1 billion investment in their university on artificial intelligence. It's hard to compete. Uh, you know, we're talking about $32 million is what was just provided into our artificial intelligence cell. And we've got some of the best brains in the world. Um, Richard Sutton, um, who, if you're, if you're interested, you can now take the Japanese bar exam and pass it using artificial intelligence. Uh, those are the kind of things that he's been able to, to deliver on. So it's been very interesting. Um, does Edmonton Global have a relationship with AIMCO, which invests globally in real estate and other investments? Um, yes, we have a very good uh, relationship with AIMCO, but actually AIMCO uh, is just starting to get into the international market. Their first foray was really into London. Uh, and they've had some good lessons out of London. Um, and we've been working with them because we think uh, they need to be in Singapore as well, because Singapore has got many uh, key uh, sovereign and other uh, large private equity firms that are based out of Singapore, or at least have relationships in Singapore. And as you know, many major infrastructure projects are no longer funded by a single, a single fund, like the Ontario Pension Fund, for example. Most of them will couple with four or five other funds to be able to de-risk the investment decisions from, uh, from themselves. And this is where I think AIMCO has some real opportunity to be able to do that. So Kevin and I have been talking uh, to see where we might be able to start to bridge that into the next, um, into the next sector. So yes, AIMCO is a key component of it. And I think AIMCO has a uh, lots of opportunity to actually do more uh, than what they're currently doing. Uh, Joe Biden has said he would cancel the pipeline. Will that have an impact? It, it certainly will. As you know, Alberta has now just gone all in on the, on the Keystone, uh, $7.5 billion in one shape or form, uh, either through loan guarantees or incentives or direct money. Um, if he cancels that, then that investment opportunity uh, will be in jeopardy. Uh, and that will also inhibit the amount of flow of oil that we have going down to the south coast. I will say, though, what is really exciting, though, was that the Northwest Refinery just got up and running. And for many of you that, uh, that follow that, I mean, that is a significant accomplishment. And it's, God bless Ian McGregor, I mean, there's a man that is stuck to his guns. I mean, it, basically from concept to build has been 18 years, right? He first thought about this in 2002 and he's now uh, delivered on it. They're producing now diesel out of bitumen at 80,000 barrels a day. It's the first refinery to be built in North America since 1983. So it's a real significant accomplishment. And what that shows is that we can do things here. Uh, the other thing that I will say we're looking at in the energy space that's got some real interest in, and Kathy Heron knows more about this than, than most is the blue hydrogen potential. Uh, blue hydrogen is, um, we have a, a, an abundant supply here in this region, uh, best in Canada. And the question is, is how do you convert that particularly into heavy haul or utilities? 
and, and it's a longer term play, but we do think hydrogen's got some real opportunity go on a go forward basis. So it still supports the uh, energy industry, but it now takes the next ad, uh, the next step in a very ecological and environmentally friendly way. Um, our recommendation of stimulus have been sent to both levels available for view. Um, I've sent it out to all our shareholders, so I, I can share with you. Um, the first one I sent was, I also chair the board of the Consider Canada City Alliance, which they call it City Alliance, but it's really Metro Regions Alliances. But it's the 12 largest economies across Canada. Toronto Global, Montreal International, Vancouver Economic Commission, and folks like that. And what we did is we penned a letter and we said, look at there are some things you can do locally uh, that will enhance our position globally. And, and one of them was around uh, inter, in, interprovincial trade barriers. As you know, there was a free trade agreement signed in 2015 or 16 uh, nationally, but it still had about 137 different interprovincial trade barriers. Uh, Jason Kenney, when he came in, actually, uh, kudos to him on his leadership. He actually knocked them all down from a provincial perspective. So if you want, you can now ship in good BC wine into Alberta. Um, but the rest of the province hasn't. So we said, let's get those trade barriers down. The Conference Board of Canada indicated that we would have upwards of 4% GDP growth just if we got rid of all our interprovincial trade barriers. The other one is infrastructure. And I don't just mean bricks and mortar. I'm talking about 5G because we need to move on that. That is what's going to enable the new economy. Uh, and then uh, a most recent letter I just penned for uh, all my partners here in the province um, that we sent into the Jack Mintz uh, Provincial Recovery Task Force was really looking at five themes um, that we think they need to consider on the Recovery Task Force side of the house. One of them, again, was about advancing advanced technology. Another one is about connectedness in terms of the 5G. And then the other one was about making this place uh, some place that somebody wanted to come to, like a place planned and a, and a, and a travel destination. Okay, uh, recommendation, yes. Okay, so I can provide those to Jody, I guess, and uh, or somebody in, the, in the, uh, the two letters that I sent, so you can pass it out to your membership if you'd like. Okay, uh, Malcolm, St. Albert has a lot of backyard bees and it's time you come west to our lovely municipality. You know, I just want you to know, I, I'm, I'm a failed beekeeper. I, I've had three, three hives so far and I, they've all swarmed. <laughs> so I just, it's cheaper to go buy the honey. Okay, is it impossible to get anywhere in the U.S. without going through Calgary, Vancouver, or Toronto? How can we change this? And this is, this is going to be a continuing challenge. As you know, especially minor markets. So from Edmonton right now, you cannot fly to Ottawa direct. You can't get to Kelowna or Grand Prairie. Uh, so until some of these things are, uh, are changed and the, uh, the, the, the air traffic continues to come back, it's going to be continuing to be very challenging to get from point destinations from point A to point B. So Malcolm, <coughs> uh, time is moving on. It's been fantastic having you with us this morning. We would love to have you come back when we meet at the golf club and, and see us again. Um, so if there are no last questions, we will